Good afternoon. Thank you all of you who are joining us in the auditorium and those who are joining us online. It is good to be with you today. I am Robin Axel Adams, the manager of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we begin. Um, wanted to remind you to let you know that the um, if you are interested in our 2023-2024 Ethics Fellowship class, that those applications are now open at fairbankcenter.org and you can click on the button for the, F the fellowship um, button and, and then that's how you can learn more. And so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can help, um, help expand and, and, and help you to understand and appreciate the wonderfulness of the fellowship. Another is that you will see the, the code to text for, yeah, oh, there, oh, I'm so sorry about that, for, um, for your attendance. So please text that code into that box. Uh, you have until 120 minutes until after the end of the activity to, to record your attendance. So please do so. You will get your certificates about 30 days after the lecture. So hang on a minute before you, you ask where your, your certificate is. This is being recorded and will be available on our website within the next week. And so you are welcome to um, encourage your, your fellow colleagues to, to watch the, the video. So this is something new. If you've listened to our lectures before, you're like, yeah, Robin has already said all these things. This is a new one. We will be utilizing the polls today for today's lecture. And so the chat box will be open for a small portion of the lecture when Dr. Torkey is ready for the polls. Uh, so please feel free, please, we want you to participate in that. So please participate in the polls. And the Q&A box is also available to post questions throughout. However, we will not be posing those questions to Dr. Torkey until the very end. And then of course, Dr. Torkey has no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. All right, it is, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Torkey, is a who is a professor of medicine, and she's the section, section chief of palliative care medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine. She's the director of the Evans Center at Indiana University Health, which conducts research and education on the role of religion and spirituality in medicine. She's also a research scientist with the Indiana University Center of Aging Research at the Regan Street Institute. She wears many hats. Dr. Torkey received her undergraduate degree from Carleton College and her MD from Indiana University. She completed residency in primary care internal medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and her fellowship training at the University of Chicago from 2005 to 2007 in primary care health re services research and ethics. She was our fellowship director at the center for 10 years. Dr. Torkey's research focuses on spirituality, religion, ethical and communication aspects of medical decision-making for older adults. Her current research focuses on surrogate decision-making for older adults with dementia and other forms of cognitive impairments. Dr. Torkey um, practices palliative care medicine with IU Health Methodist Hospital, where she cares for adults with serious illness, including Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, and lung disease. In her spare time, she likes to hike, kayak, and camp. And so today we are co-sponsoring this lecture with the risk retention group. And so when we gather together to talk about what, we, what do we need to do, um, how can we help and what are you seeing in the risk department? And there were lots of questions around um, patients' rights of refusal. And I was just telling Dr. Torkey that we've actually had a couple of ethics consults just in the past week with that question. And immediately the person that came to our mind was Dr. Lexi Torkey. So it is our exciting, and it's so exciting for us to um, invite Dr. Torkey to come and share with us. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. It's really good to be here with you today. Um, and I'm going to be um, spending some time um, talking about cases that have both, of course, legal and ethical implications. And in addition to myself, I'm very excited that I have a friend on the phone today, Cynthia Acklemeyer from our legal department. And so if there are legal questions, I will defer them to her because I'm certainly not a lawyer. Um, and I am going to try to make this as interactive as possible. I think all of us, um, I was, we were just chatting about how Zoom has really expanded our ability to um, have educational sessions that, that, are, that are accessible far and wide. Um, and that's been wonderful, but the downside is that um, it is a little bit harder to make things interactive and to engage with each other. And so I've um, picked up some tips and tricks from um, a colleague who focuses a lot on adult education. And so I've tried to do some things that are interactive. So bear with me, especially in this hybrid setting as we do these, this kind of um, interactive approach and we'll, we're gonna be trying it out. And I need to advance, let's see. There we go, okay. So the topic for today is what to do when your patient refuses medical treatment. 
Um, and what I'm going to do today is um, first provide a little bit of ethical and legal framework, and I mean a very little, so the very basics about how we justify um, refusal, patient refusals and respecting patient refusals. And then we're going to go into four cases um, because I think we really learn best. I mean, in ethics, we often talk about cases and as a mentor once told me, um, we learn medicine one case at a time. And so I think it can be really helpful to walk through cases because they illustrate some of the nuances we deal with. And I will say that this lecture, for the most part, will focus on patients who we generally assume to have decisional capacity or the ability to accept and refuse treatment. Um, and I think what's important here is you think that might make it easy, but it actually doesn't. There are still ethical challenges and legal challenges, even among patients who we would generally say um, retain their decision-making capacity. So that's what we're going to be exploring today. So beginning with the ethical considerations, um, I think this has become so standard um, in our current ethical thinking that we almost take it for granted that the most important ethical principle when we think about patient consent and refusal is autonomy. Um, we define autonomy as the moral right of every individual to choose and follow his or her own plan of life and actions. And in medicine, that mostly boils down to the fact that patients have a right to refuse or accept a clinician's recommendations. Um, and to give informed consent, which is an ethical principle that has arisen primarily from autonomy, patients must be provided information, they must be able to understand or have comprehension, and they must be able to provide consent, which must be voluntary, so they must be more or less free from coercion. Um, and this is kind of the basic framework that we use when we're talking about refusal. Um, and then legal history, I'm just going to point to a couple of cases which really happened throughout the 20th century that established this concept of informed consent. So as you can see from this case, the concept of consent's been around for over 100 years, where a patient, Mary Schlendorf, was diagnosed with a fibroid tumor. The physician recommended surgery, but she refused, but she did consent to an exam under anesthesia. The tumor was removed. Um, in this case, the court found that every human being of adult years and sign, sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body, and a surgeon who performs an operation without his patient's consent commits an assault, and I, I bolded assault, for which he is liable in damages. This is true except in cases of emergency, where the patient is unconscious and where it is necessary to operate before consent can be obtained. Um, I'll point out that I haven't changed the dated language, although it's not the language that I would have used with his and his and him um, for both the pregnant woman and or the woman with the tumor, the fibroid tumor, and the physician. Um, but this is what, how it appears in history. Um, and so this established consent, the idea that doing something to a person without them saying yes is an assault or a battery, and we can't do that in medicine. Um, and the second important case I'll mention, um, in this one, Martin Salgo underwent an aortogram that left him paraplegic, and he sued um, Stanford University for failing to inform him about the risks of the procedure. This um, helps set the precedent that a patient must be informed of the risks and benefits of the procedure. Um, in this court decision, said a physician violates his duty to protect his patient and subjects himself to liability if he withholds any factors which are necessary to form the basis of an intelligent consent. So not just any consent, but intelligent consent prior to the proposed treatment. Likewise, the physician may not minimize the known dangers of a procedure or operation in order to induce his patient's consent. Um, so not only do we need consent, we need it to be informed. Um, and there have been many other court cases and ethics cases that expand on the notion of what it means to be informed, how much information, what kind of information, how should that information be presented? Um, how do we determine that the patient in fact understands the information? That's a little bit behind, beyond the scope of what we'll talk about today, but it certainly relates to some of the cases. Okay, so we'll start out with case one. This is Ms. J. She is an 86-year-old woman with a history of peripheral vascular disease. She's admitted to the hospital with an ischemic bowel. So basically, she has a part of her bowel that has not gotten blood flow. It is now dead. The surgery team evaluates her and recommends a bowel resection. She refuses the surgery. She states she has lived a long life and would like to focus on comfort and her quality of life. She's named her niece, who lives in New York, as her healthcare representative. Her niece is flying in tomorrow to see Miss J. Um, this is a very similar to a case that I did when I was an ethics con a fellow at the University of Chicago many years ago. Um, and 
well, in some ways to me, this case seemed like a slam dunk. The team was very uncomfortable. And in fact, the faculty member, a very senior ethics consultant named Mark Siegler was very uncomfortable with this case. Um, and he really, he really worried about whether or not we should honor Ms. J's preferences. Um, but I wonder what all of you think. So the next thing I'd like to do is to ask you, what is the right thing to do for Ms. J? So the choices are respect her right to refuse the surgery, try to convince her to have the surgery so she can live longer, provide sedation and take her to the operating room or call her niece and she's the healthcare representative. Okay, so those of you on Zoom can go ahead and vote, to pick your choice. And for those of you in the room, I'm just gonna kind of get a feel. So who says A, respect her right to refuse the surgery? Okay, I see a pretty good number of hands. B, try to convince her to have the surgery so she can live longer. I see a hand, oh good, I'm glad. C, provide sedation, take her to the operating room for surgery. No hands. D, call her niece since she's the healthcare representative. Okay, do you see responses coming in, Annie, on the poll? Okay, so let's give it maybe 10 more seconds. Go ahead and vote if you have it. Um, so in the room, by far and away, the most common answer was A, but we had one person um, be brave and say B try to convince her to have the surgery so she can live longer. All right, so let's present. Okay, so similar to in the room, 89% um, of you said respect her right to refuse the surgery. So the vast majority would respect this patient's autonomy. Um, the second number was try to convince her to have the surgery so she can live longer. No one voted for C, I'm glad, because that's really not outside the bounds of what we would regard as ethical or legal and call her niece and she's the healthcare representative. Okay, so this is great. Um, and I'm glad we have just a little bit of difference of opinion. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about why we're so comfortable most of us with A, but also why there might be other choices. Um, and I think the issue here, let me just go on to my sec next slide for a moment. Click on the slide, yep. Okay, thank you. Oops, that's another question. So I'm just gonna talk for a moment. Um, is that, okay, so for the most part, this woman seems to have the right to refuse surgery and that she is, um, she seems to have decision-making capacity by all we can tell. She is giving reasons for why she doesn't want the surgery. And her reasons seem, you know, pretty, logical to us. I mean, she's 89 years old. It would be really hard to have a bowel resection. Bowel resections are big surgeries. Um, and if, if you have one and you're 89 years old, even if one survives, it's quite likely that a person would have a long period of rehab. And that might be really uncomfortable. Um, and so there are all these reasons why we, it would be logical to respect her refusal of surgery. Um, but there are other challenges too, which is that the surgeons felt very strongly that a bowel resection would probably save her life. Um, and this woman, I'll just tell you, Miss J was an active woman who was living alone. She was doing well, um, didn't have a lot of other diseases, didn't have a lot of other suffering. And it just makes sense that we value life. Um, and so valuing Mrs. J's life really led the surgeon to feel uncomfortable and also led, um, to, you know, Dr. Mark Siegler, who's definitely a pretty, you know, leading ethicist to feel really uncomfortable about this. And so he went to the bedside and said, you know, I'm just uncomfortable with your refusal. And I just want to have you consider with me about what it might be like to have the surgery. Um, I think the question, the question there is how far can we go? Um, what, is an what is acceptable as far as sharing our values with the patient and what is too far, what is going too far where in fact we are being coercive? Um, it's also valuable to consider under what ethical principle would one try to convince her to have the surgery? So we have a question in the chat yeah. that I think yeah. is kind of ties into this. So yeah. was Miss J in some way unable to make her own wishes known? I didn't notice if that was in the facts. That's a great question. She was able to express her own wishes um, coherently. Um, and so by the, by the, by the team's account, she had decision-making capacity and could give her, make her preferences known. Um, and again, she does not have cognitive impairment. Um, she was able to do the things. And again, this isn't a lecture on decisional capacity, but I'll tell you that basically she was able to understand the proposed surgery, give her reasons, say what might happen if she didn't get the surgery and make a choice. I mean, she basically had those, those capacities. Um, so that's important. Um, the, the other thing that I think is worth considering about Part B is that um, 
we don't just care. We did not, none of us went into to our clinical work um, to preserve autonomy. If you ask someone like, why do you want to be a nurse or why do you want to be a doctor or a chaplain? They don't say, well, I'm going to preserve autonomy. No, you say, I want to take care of people. I want to help them. And we often think about the principle of best interest when we do that, or we often call it beneficence. So it's reasonable to try to convince her of something that you think is the best thing for her, right? Because that's what we're here for. Um, so in this case, we have a little bit of a, of a clash of principles. Okay, so the vast majority of you thought you would respect her right to have the surgery, and that was, in the end, the decision that was made, that that is a reasonable thing. Okay, now we will go on to the next question. Whoops, um, what did I do? Oh, what other steps might you take in her care? Okay, so let's put up the second poll, explore her goals for her own medical care, consider a palliative care consult or hospice referral, ask if the two of you can talk to the niece together so she can hear what Ms. J has decided or all of the above. All right, so um, start the voting on the on the Zoom, and then for, for all of you, um, okay, who would say just A, explore her goals for her medical care, B, consider a palliative care consult or a hospice referral, C, ask if the two of you can talk to the niece together, and D, all of the above. All right, lots of hands go up for all of the above. That's okay, great, and let's, all right, let's give it a, a few more seconds and then see what the people on the Zoom call said. All right. Okay, so one, you know, a, a few people said explore her goals for medical care, which is, I think, correct. Um, but the vast majority said all of the above, which I think is great. Um, so if someone with, and this is a little bit of a clinical fact, if someone with a ischemic bowel does not have surgery, they will probably become septic and die. That is probably what will happen. It would be extremely unlikely that she would survive life with ischemic bowel. Um, so what's going to happen is that she's going to decline. Um, so I think all of these things are quite important. Explore her goals for her medical care. What does she hope for? Um, and I think that this is a, primar a primary commitment that we have to our patients of non-abandonment, that even when they refuse a procedure that might be life-saving, there are many other things that we still can and should offer them. Um, consider a palliative care consult or a hospice referral. She probably will die from an untreated ischemic bowel. And so that is a really good thing to do. Ask if the two of you can talk to the niece together so she can hear what Ms. J has decided. It is quite likely that Ms. J will lo lose capacity at some time in the near future as she declines. And it's so important to, that her healthcare representative know what she decided. Um, and we sometimes skip, skip this step and unfortunately then have a, health, a healthcare representative come in from out of town who hasn't heard any of this and doesn't know what's going on. And of course, this can be very upsetting and problematic to the healthcare representative who, who might even say, that's crazy. Of course, she should have this life-saving surgery. Let's change the plan and get her down to the operating room. Um, so we were able to have that conversation with the family member um, and with the healthcare representative. Um, and um, this patient went on into hospice. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. What if Miss J was a 50 year old? Very good question. What if Miss J was a 50 year old and was otherwise healthy and had a long life expectancy? So that's really interesting. Um, I know that we would feel even more uncomfortable. Um, and this is, again, I think because of that challenge between our desire to do what is best for the patient or best interests and our desire to respect the patient's autonomy. Um, and as we'll talk about in a future case, those, those two things can overlap in very conflicting ways. So it would be even more uncomfortable um, if a person were 50 years old, had a long life ahead of them, if they were to, to receive this surgery and actually probably a much better outcome from a surgery, right? If a person is 50, they generally recover more quickly. Um, they might not need as much rehab. Um, they probably could get back to a very high quality of life. Um, so it would be more complex. Um, the question is, in the end, would the principles balance out in the same way? So that's, yeah, that's a tough one. All right. So just to discuss some of these things, um, and, you know, I'll touch on each of these points. She's rational, cooperative, and at a stage in life where focusing on comfort seems reasonable, but it would be even harder if she were younger um, and healthy. Um, so that's one of the things that, that seems so difficult. She meets all the criteria for informed consent. But she's not doing what the surgeons want her to do. Insert, the surgeons feel very uncomfortable with this. And I think we've talked a little bit about why. 
um, the surgeons feel that their goal is to save lives, right? Um, they want to provide health care. They want to help make people healthy. And they think that they could save this woman's life. Um, and yet she is saying no. And so that makes us very uncomfortable. All right, so we will now go on to case two. So this is Mr. Amadan. That's a name I knew from a friend in childhood, but it also go, it also starts out with AMA, get it? So Mr. Amadan is a 59-year-old man who has a history of diabetes and a right leg amputation. He lives alone and has no family that he will identify to his medical team. He's had multiple admissions related to his diabetes, but he often leaves AMA after a few days. He's admitted with a wound of his left foot and cellulitis. On hospital day three, he becomes very angry at the staff for delivering his medications late. He states that he's leaving the hospital. His nurse and his physician tell him that he's at high risk of needing a foot amputation if he does not receive IV antibiotics. He states he's leaving anyway and going home where he can take his medications on time. Any of you ever met a patient, an angry patient, um, who doesn't get what they want in the hospital? And sometimes it's legit, right? I mean, we're supposed to deliver medications on time and there are many reasons why this doesn't happen as well as it often should. This is just, and probably post, post pandemic or whatever we're in now, um, it's even harder, right? There's staffing shortages in all aspects of the hospital and many people doing the best they can, but it's not perfect. All right, whoops, okay. So what is the next step for Mr. Amadon? A, honor his request to leave the hospital, ask him to sign the AMA form. B, explore the reasons for his anger. Provide validation about his concerns regarding the timing of his medical care. C, call a behavior alert to keep him in the hospital. Okay, let's launch the next poll. Um, and then for those of you in the room who would honor his request to leave the hospital, and again, this is the next step, ask him to sign the AMA form. Who would do that now? See, some, see a, a couple hands. Um, explore the reasons for his anger. Provide validation for his concerns. Okay, that's a popular option in the room. Call a behavior alert to keep him in the hospital. I don't see any hands. All right, for those of you on the Zoom call, and I'm so glad I see over 130 participants, which is awesome. Um, let's go ahead and see how those folks voted. Okay, explore the reasons for his anger and provide validation. Um, I Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think that's great. Um, because again, it's about the next step. It's not about what we're eventually going to do and whether we're going to eventually respect his reasoning. Um, but the bottom line, there are so many times in ethics um, conundrums or legal conundrums where it's important to take a deep breath and just slow things down. Um, and so this guy may be packing his bags and getting ready to storm out, but if, if you can, um, you know, go to the bedside or send a new person or a trusted figure to the bedside to just say, you know, please talk to me. Um, and that kind of um, listening and validating their concerns um, can often avert um, the inevitable conflict when someone wants to walk out the door. Um, so absolutely, we would, um, you know, have someone validate his concerns, talk to him a little bit, try to kind of allay some of his anger, try to form a bond with this guy. Um, so that we can provide the medical care that we think is, is the right care. All right, so, let's see here, click. Okay. Got it. All right, great, okay. All right, so we'll discuss this a little bit. So, you know, I think this is an, an interesting question that really kind of, um, poses a little bit of a challenge for what we mean by autonomy. So true autonomy, as I've mentioned, is being able to make decisions in accordance with one's own life goals and plans. Um, but we often break it down to something much more basic. And I think this is true both in the ethics world, but maybe particularly in the, in the legal world, where we tend to define autonomy kind of shallowly as I get to do what I want. Um, and that's because it can be really hard to determine whether people's reasons are good reasons and when they're, they're in accordance with one own goals and plans. Um, and, and so in this is an example. I mean, if this guy leaves with cellulitis in his foot, he's a diabetic, he's lost his other leg, he's likely to lose this foot. He's clearly someone who wants to live on his own and be able to take care of himself and he's gonna have no legs. Right, so he's gonna be much more limited into, in terms of what he can do. Um, and so it's really, it really raises a question of whether refusing medical care and going home is, is truly in accord with his own goals and wishes. 
And yet it's challenging because especially in the United States, but in certainly in most free societies, we respect people decisions, even if they're pretty bad. Um, and so it's a really a question of, uh, are we upholding what we might call true autonomy, or are we just upholding kind of a shallow version of autonomy where you say, fine, do what you want, you know, sign the AMA slip and get out of here. Um, and I'd say that as clinicians, we have the obligation to try to uphold the truest form of autonomy where we go to a patient and work with them to honor the, the, the kind of their most highest values in their life. So his autonomous choice seems to be in conflict with his own best interests, which again gets back to this principle of beneficence, a moral obligation to act for the benefit of others. Um, and I think in this case, we need to try to get him to, um, to see the big picture and consider these other alternatives before we let him go. So I would say that this is a toughie, but let's, tr let's try first to keep him in the hospital. Let's say this guy says, you know, thank you for your concern, but I'm leaving. I don't, I'm not taking this anymore and you can't boss me around. And you, you decide reluctantly and sadly that you have to let him go. So now what's the most appropriate discharge plan? Do not write for any prescriptions if he will not stay for his course of antibiotics. Provide a follow-up appointment in two weeks with his primary care doctor to see if he'll reconsider his decision or provide oral antibiotics, a follow-up visit in two weeks and outpatient wound care. Okay, let's float the poll. For those of you in the room, who would not write for any prescriptions if he will not stay for his, anti his antibiotics? B, provide a follow-up appointment in two weeks to see if he's changed his mind. And C, provide oral antibiotics, a follow-up visit in two weeks and outpatient wound care. Okay, so I see a lot of hands for C in the room. Let's close the poll and see what people online said. Okay, so there's one for A, uh, two for B and a lot for C. So let's go through these one at a time because I think this is really important. And I will tell you that over the course of my medical practice, I have had a lot of colleagues and staff say, well, if he's leaving AMA, we can't write prescriptions. We can't do anything. He just has to go. Um, and I wanna say that I think that is an ethical violation. I think that is wrong. So there aren't they're too many cases in ethics where we tell you that something is right or wrong, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say that I think that's the wrong choice um, because even when we don't like a patient, what a patient does, we still have this obligation of beneficence to that patient. We still have to try to uphold their best interest, even if it's not what we regard as the first best choice. Um, I've heard the argument that, well, then we'll be responsible if things don't turn out very well. Um, and that is really not the case. Um, and again, I, I'm you know, getting to the point where I'll, I, I like quoting other people, but I had a mentor when I was a resident say, you can get sued for doing the right thing or get sued for doing the wrong thing. So you should probably do the right thing. Um, and in this case, providing this guy with appro the, the appropriate second best medical care is the right thing to do, um, even if he's leaving AMA. Um, provide a follow-up visit is, is kind of a middle ground. It's not too bad. At least you're doing some follow-up, which is good. Um, but again, the right thing to do here, I think, is to provide the, the best care that you can under the circumstances. Um, and again, this is more of a logistics thing, but you could even you know, wonder if you might be able to have home health at home and get IV antibiotics at home, um, which would provide a much closer um, standard of care to what you'd be able to provide in the hospital. So, um, so I would say that we are obligated to continue to provide high quality care, uh, the best care we can, even when in fact, it's not the care that we think is really, really what we would like to provide. Okay, here's the third one, Ms. Q. Ms. Q is a 55-year-old woman with a history of lupus and borderline personality disorder. She's admitted for shortness of breath and found to have COVID-19. She bonds closely with a nurse on her team and tells her that the resident involved in her case doesn't listen to her and she fears she's getting inferior care. She refuses to allow blood draws or to go to radiology for a follow-up x-ray. The resident tells her that these things are necessary for her care. She requests to see a patient advocate and states she's being harassed by the medical team. Today, her oxygen saturation is low on room air, 89%, and her respiratory rate is high, 26. So what is the resident's ethical obligation to Ms. Q? Continue to provide any hospital care that's indicated and that she will accept. Give her the facts about the proper treatment of COVID-19. Tell her that if she refuses appropriate medical therapy for the COVID-19, she'll be discharged home or arranged transfer to another medical team. All right, so we'll see the questions. Okay, who would do A, continue to provide any hospital care that she will accept? Okay, I see some hands. B, give her the facts about the proper treatment of COVID-19. 
That's um, C, tell her if she refuses appropriate therapy, she'll be discharged home. And D, arrange transfer to another medical team. I see a hand there. Okay, so a little bit of, a little bit of um, differences of opinion about this one. All right, let's see what the poll, the Zoom. This is interesting. So, so I, this is kind of what I was hoped as these cases get a little more difficult as time goes on. Um, and so in this case, you know, I think that there are, there is room for disagreement. Um, okay, so some fo so the majority said A, um, give her the facts about the proper treatment. So maybe this is an information problem, an information deficit. And so providing her with information is certainly part of informed consent. It is part of our obligation to the patient. Um, tell her if she refuses appropriate medical therapy, she'll be sent home. You know, I think that one is challenging because right now she's short of breath and her oxygen saturation is low. Um, and again, I'll just put in a couple of medical factoids is that as a general rule, um, you know, a re she's a, you know, she's not super elderly. 89% is probably not normal for her. So she probably has dropped and she's also um, breathing fast. So she's probably, we'd call her, you know, hypoxic to some extent, or certainly short of breath um, and she needs some oxygen. Um, so unless we could safely send her home with oxygen, that probably wouldn't be a safe choice. And then arrange transfer to another medical team is something we consider when an individual is in conflict with a team. So it is something that we consider, um, but I think the question is, is it really the best approach for right now, given this patient's current medical and psychiatric history? All right, so let's, let's talk about some of these things. Um, oh, we're gonna take another thing. Okay, this is where I'd like Annie to open the chat. Um, so one thing that I like to do on chat, and also let's see if I can share, so open the chat and then I'm gonna share it. Um, yeah, we'll see if this works. Okay, so I'm gonna share the chat and I'm gonna ask you, those of you on Zoom to do what's called a chat waterfall. So you see my little waterfall graphic here. Um, so basically what I want everyone to do is, um, let me move this just so you can see the question. What steps could you take to support Mrs. Q? Everybody type in one thing you could do to, to support Mrs. Q, but don't hit enter. So go ahead and type it in. Everybody in the room, just kind of think of something. What's one thing you could do to support Ms. Q? Okay, now I'm gonna say one, two, three, go. And I want everyone to hit enter on the call and those of you in the room can shout out something you'd do. Okay, listen to her, assess capacity, have another staff talk to her, psych consult. What, is it, what do you guys say in the room? Validate her feelings, social work consult. Shout out to all the social workers in the room. Patient advocate, explore her care concerns. Listen, anyone else in the room? Chaplain consult, find out why she's angry. These are great ideas. What, I mean, anything different that for folks in the room? Yeah, reach her family to see if they could help with her permission, because again, she, you know, we more or less she has capacity, even though we're, we're concerned about her. A sister with coping skills, that is a great one. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so there are so many things that we can do for um, this patient, um, even though her care is, um, is challenging to the team. So we'll talk a little bit now um, about kind of what her psychiatric condition is. She has borderline personality disorder. And I'll say that many people have this and it's never diagnosed. Um, and this is because nationwide, we do not have the right kind of mental health support for people who have this condition. Um, therapy for this condition is long-term and difficult. Um, and so it's often just undiagnosed if the only care they get is like, for example, the, the periodic inpatient consult during a crisis where no one, no one in the mental health field really gets a chance to get to know or speak with her over a long time. So there's a little graphic that shows kind of the criteria. There's instability in relationships, instability in self-image and emotions, marked impulsivity. Um, people often have unstable relationships where they often might idealize someone and then suddenly feel very much the opposite about them and think they don't care. Um, and there's splitting, feeling very positively towards someone or very negatively towards, um, towards someone. And this may happen in a team where they split one person positively and think they're the best and someone else on the team really can't do anything right. Um, there often is a fear of abandonment that is really substantial, um, but people with borderline personality disorder usually retain rational thought. And as a general rule, we think of them as having capacity. Um, a psychotic episode can be a part of borderline personality disorder, but unless that person is, is diagnosed as having psychosis in general, we respect their decision-making capacity. So these can be 
some of the most challenging patient situations because on the one hand, that person has the legal and probably the ethical right to make their own decisions. On the other hand, they're very challenging to take care of. Um, they you know, they sometimes accuse the team of doing things that are bad to them. The team often gets split amongst themselves and has conflict with each other. Um, and often the patient accepts and then refuses treatment in an intermittent basis that make it very hard to determine a care plan. Um, and this is some of this has been some of the most challenging ethics case consults that I've been involved in for sure. Um, so we can provide support and non-abandonment. Um, and this is very important because a fear of abandonment is a fundamental aspect of this disorder. Um, and so establishing a continuity of relationship with them, having someone say, you know, no matter what happens, I'm not going to leave you. Um, refer for long-term psychiatric treatment if, if available. And there are treatments um, that are, that long-term treatments, inpatient and outpatient, that are available. One is dialectical behavioral therapy, for example. Um, and so if the patient, if there's any way to have the patient engage in long-term treatment, that's ideal because this patient's going to be back in the hospital again. Um, hold team meetings and engage support for the team. We've sometimes had another staff member or a psychiatrist meet with the team um, to avoid team conflicts and distress, um, which such a patient can also create in their unit. And then continue to offer appropriate medical treatments whenever possible. Okay, so um, the bottom line is this patient, we would continue to offer appropriate medical treatments and would try very hard to convince this patient to take the treatments where available. Um, but as long as this patient is medically unstable and is accepting at least her oxygen um, and basic care in the hospital, we can't just send her out, unfortunately. Now, this might get even more challenging if she's the one who decides she wants to go AMA. Um, I think then we have to take a careful look at, you know, is she in fact retaining her decision-making capacity and would we let her go out the door if in fact she's at risk of respiratory failure? Um, and that is another example of something that is scary um, for us as clinicians when we're very worried that a patient might collapse at home. And I see a question. And, yeah. Thank you. So I'll repeat that since we didn't have the microphone out, but um, there's a comment that borderline personality disorder is often associated with a history of early trauma. So it can be childhood sexual trauma, physical trauma, um, and I, that that helps us really um, have compassion for individuals who have this disorder. Um, they've had a very hard life. Um, and I'll say something. I think that's especially important because it's something that should, when you're, when you're with a patient, something that often triggers the thought that this person might have borderline personality disorder is that they're hard to like. They just are, and their interactions with other people make it hard to really have compassion. So it's normal for people to just be so frustrated. Um, and so to think about what it is in their life that they've been through, um, yeah, might grow our compassion for them and then to help us. Um, and then learning strategies, learning where this comes from, and then learning strategies that can be helpful for them. So even when it's frustrating. Yeah, we can maintain our compassion. So thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. Okay, so this is going to be, the next one's going to be our last case. Oops. Okay, Mr. V, an 18 year old man with a history of asthma. And I'll just say the older I get, the harder it is to call 18 year olds Mr. So-and-so. It used to be easy for me, but I'm just, so I don't, I don't know quite what to do about this because I trained in a hospital where everybody was called by their last name. Um, at Grady in Atlanta. Okay, so Mr. V, is a, he's an adult. He's an 18-year-old with a history of asthma. He's otherwise healthy and just graduated from high school with honors. He's planning to go to a nearby state college. He's had multiple prior hospitalizations. Today, he shows up in the emergency room very short of breath. He's had a bad case of bronchitis, and his breathing has gotten worse over the past three days. On exam, he has very few breath sounds, and that's a bad sign. Let me just tell you that when we can hear lots of wheezing in an asthmatic, at least they're moving air. This guy's not even moving air anymore and a respiratory rate of 30. Despite aggressive treatment with nebulizers and steroids, he remains very short of breath and seems to be getting tired. His oxygen saturation is 90%. Um, and I'll say that, you know, for any of you who've ever had a pulse oxygen on your finger, it should be 99 or 100%. Um, you know, this 18 year old kid should have a pulse ox that's high. And so having eight, you know, 90% means that he's not doing well. 
the emergency room physician tells him he needs to be intubated and placed on a breathing machine. And he says, no way, no way. I never want to be on that machine. Okay, so let's go to our polling question. If you were the emergency physician, what would you do? A, try to reason with him about the need for a ventilator since he's clearly getting tired despite maximal therapy. Um, let's go ahead and have you raise your hand. Would anyone do A? So I see, I see a few hands. Okay. B, honor his preference to refuse intubation, provide morphine to reduce the feeling of dyspnea. C, call his parents to provide informed consent. D, provide sedation and intubation. Okay, I see a hand, although Brian, you raised your hand twice, but some of you didn't vote. Some of you didn't vote. So, so Brian would do two things and the rest of you would do nothing and just thank, be, just thank God that you're not the emergency room physician. <laughs> Okay, let's see how people voted on the line. And go ahead, guys, take a guess. There's no, you don't get, you know, whatever. You don't get reduced points for guessing. Okay, so the majority of people would try to reason with him about the, the need for a ventilator. Um, and then B the, the, was honor his preference to refuse intubation. The third most popular option was provide sedation and intubation. And C, call his parents to provide informed consent was only one person. Okay, so um, let me go through these things with you, um, and we'll talk. We'll kind of talk about the the options. So um, this is where I'm going to go out. This is another case where I'm going to go on a limb. I've thought about this case for years, ever since it was described to me by an attending. So I'm going to tell you what I would do, and it's not the most popular option. I'd tube this kid. I would provide sedation and intubation. That is what I would do in a heartbeat. Because um, so this is really tough, right? He is 18. He is a legal adult. And I am going to override his preferences um, and his autonomy in this moment. And let's. And so we should take a moment to think about why might I do that. Um, and I'll tell you what. One issue is that um, it's an emergency, and it's really tough to, to to make these decisions in an emergency. And especially, you'll come upon cases in your practice where you've never encountered this particular situation. You haven't, unlike me in this case, had years to think about it. And that's really tough. So, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? You're standing here, this kid's you know breathing really rough. Um, what are you gonna do? Are you really gonna let this kid die um, when they're, you know, seem like they have the potential for a long and healthy life? Um, so in this case, this is one where the patient's best interests seem strongly opposed to what the patient is telling you. And that's really a problem. Um, and so I would say, given his impending respiratory failure, this is one of those rare cases where you might be justified in an emergency to provide intubation against his will. So not everyone's gonna agree with me and I look forward to hearing from our lawyer colleague um, because this is a tough one and the majority of the audience did not agree with me. So I'll say that. Um, the second one, which I also think is reasonable, is try to reason with him. Um, and that, of course, depends on how much time you have. So again, I mean, if he's becoming unconscious, you don't have time anymore. Um, but if he is, if you can talk with him, um, you could reason with him. And you could also provide support to him, which probably honestly is more important, right? I know you're scared. This is very scary. You know, it's very scary to think about being intubated. But I want to tell you that I think you're going to do really well, and this is worth it. Um, so this might be an area where, again, conjoling, um, you know, um, uh, reasoning with, trying to convince him of, his, of what you think his best interests are is indicated. It's appropriate. In fact, I think it's an ethical obligation. And then even going is, you know, like, I mean, I'd go beyond coercion. I just do it. So this is a tough one, but that's what I do. Um, the other options, um, call his parents. At this point, we think he has capacity. And this is a challenge. Um, is that we, um, we know when we study adolescents and young adults um, that decision-making capacity is something that grows over time, right? Nobody wakes up one day and they have capacity. Um, and we know that um, it, there's variation, right? And when people get enough, really enough um, reasoning capacity, some 12-year-olds have enough reason that you would really say they had informed consent. And yet legally, we have to draw a line in the sand. And so we draw that line at the, on the 18th birthday, um, but we have to acknowledge that it's not a perfect line, right? Um, and we also know from studies that have been done that young people generally make the same, make the same quality decisions as older people on, under what we call kind of cold 
emotional situation. So on a reasonable, calm day, they'll make good decisions. But when anxiety is heightened, then their decision-making declines in young people more than adults. Um, so this is tough. You have to think about the psychology of this 18-year-old and how does that factor in. Um, but he does legally have the capacity. Um, and then there are many cases where we honor someone's preference to refuse intubation, but I'm just not sure if this is one of them. And morphine is an appropriate medication. So this was the hardest question, and this is something I do want all of you to wrestle with. And it's okay if you disagree, because I mean, it's okay if you disagree about any of this, because again, um, this is tough. Um, but this is one where I actually think that it would be reasonable to override um, what this patient is telling you right now. Okay, so this is one, is this truly an autonomous choice? Um, can you really think of the scared, short of breath 18 year old is making an autonomous choice? What about best interest? And I'd say this is one of these things where best interest is just a huge factor in this case. Um, and then what do you do when there's no time to think, when it's emergency and you haven't had the chance? And, and sometimes we do, there is a bit of a rule of thumb that if you don't have time to think, just err on the side of life. Um, and I've had to do this sometimes where I've gotten, when, I, when I, I, I don't do ethics consult anymore, I'm sad to say, but I've gotten a call. I'm in the emergency room and there's this guy and he's saying, don't intubate him. And I think we should intubate him and his family's here and they're saying intubate him. I'm just like, I can't help you. I can't make this decision with you over the phone with everyone yelling. You're going to, you know, if, you, if you're not sure, you're going to have to intubate. I can't tell you not to intubate in that moment. Um, and so that's tough. There are emergency situations where we have to slow things down um, and where, you um, we really needed a little bit of time to think. And if you let the patient die, obviously there's no going back. Um, so let me summarize some takeaways from the cases and then we'll go to our Q&A. Um, is that patients with decisional capacity have the right to refuse treatment and that's under most circumstances. Even when patients refuse the best treatment, we have obligations to advocate for their best interests, to offer them alternatives and to maintain a therapeutic relationship. Our ethical involvement may involve advocating for life-saving treatment, and that may involve just a, a more discussion. Tell me why you don't want this, or let me tell you why I think this treatment's a really good idea. Um, but there may be rare cases where overriding a patient's wishes is acceptable. But as I've shown you through these cases, that, that's rare. Um, you know, that's the extreme end of things. All right, so that's all I've prepared, and I definitely left some time for comments and questions. Um, and so I know Amy, or sorry, Amy, God, Annie, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed I did that after it's my 25 years. cent jar. Lexi. What's that? It's my 25 cent jar. You got to put oh, 25 seriously? cents in. Well, it's still happening, huh? Not just by me. Okay. Um, so um, there, Amy, oh my God, Annie will handle the questions in the Q&A and the rest of you can raise your hand and we've got microphones for the, for in the room. So let's start with with one from the Zoom. Uh, so this was going back to to Mr. V. He, um, somebody asked, but he isn't, isn't, but he isn't even on BiPAP or anything yet. According to the limited background given, why not start there? There you go. Okay. So, and that's wonderful. Absolutely. And I'd say that, um, you know, I, I really, I didn't have that on the table, but you're absolutely right that maybe, um, that I didn't really specify what other oxygen he was currently on and that there may be other ways to kind of stave off what he doesn't want. Okay. Let's try BiPAP. You're absolutely right. And honestly, I should change this case to say that like he's on BiPAP or, you know, he can't handle the mask or something because, um, you know, but you're, it's absolutely true that sometimes when we think about these cases, there are sort of logistical solutions that buy us time. And absolutely, if that's an option, we should go for it. Yeah. Anyone in the room have a question? Otherwise, we can go to another on the Zoom. Brian. Dr. Torkey, outstanding as always. Um, this question pertains, I think it was to the second case about the AMA discharge. Yeah. Um, and sorry, this isn't definitively an ethics question, but this has come up a couple times about um, if insurance or um, certain resources by definition become unavailable to patients if they are discharged under AMA status. And I didn't know if you were able to speak to that at all because I, I appreciate it and agree with your um, perspective that uh, just because a patient is leaving the hospital against medical advice does not permit us to diminish the, the opportunities to provide the highest quality of care within that framework. But right. I but it's it sounds to me like there may actually be legitimate constraints to doing so. And I didn't know if you were able to speak to that at all. Um, yeah. So 
I cannot from a financial, and I'm going to ask if anyone else has information on that actually is, I mean, what I would say, yeah, that's a consideration. And it would be a consideration, say, if you want to do home IV antibiotics or no one will take the patient without a payer. Um, but does anyone know if that's the case? It's an urban legend. It's an urban legend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've never seen any patient. Yeah. I'm not aware of that. Okay. So good to know it's an urban legend. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, if the patient doesn't have a good payer source, you know, there are, what is it, $4 antibiotics at Walmart, you know, like there are ways to kind of make it happen so that you can do something. Um, all right. Let's, um, let's do one more question. And then actually, I just want to ask Cynthia if she has any other comments or other points. So in the, in the Q&A um, on Zoom is kind of just comments towards Mr. V again, uh, just um, you know, emergent decision wishes can be explored later as we do not yet know what the outcome is. And then someone else said, I think if someone is struggling to breathe, they aren't thinking clearly. So reasoning would be difficult in my opinion. Yeah. So that's a really, that's kind of a question about, about capacity. And in this case, again, I mean, we could argue about whether what 89% oxygenation really means as far, you know, what are his other respiratory parameters. Um, but let's just say that he sort of has reasoning capacity or like sort of, but you're right, he's so upset. I mean, it's terrifying, right? Who wouldn't be terrified? And can we really make good decisions when we're in that situation? Yeah, whether it's because of biology and, you know, being hypoxic or whether it's just because of the anxiety of air hunger. So, Cynthia, do you have any other questions or comments that you... The only thing I would add is we get asked in legal this question occasionally about capacity, and I just want to make everyone aware who's listening that capacity can wax and wane. And I get the question a lot, well, this person has been deemed to not have capacity, so the care team assumes they don't have capacity throughout the entire admission. And that's not true. It can wax and wane on any given day, any given hour. Yeah, so that's a really it good may point. need to be reassessed. Yes. You know, we try to have the conversations when the patient is at their best. Um, and so when that's possible, that's what we do. All right. Um, there's, I see, is there any more, any more questions in the Q&A? Anyone else in the room have a question? All right. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Appreciate thank you, it. Dr. Torkey.